Commit yourself to pursue knowledge. Men, I challenge you to decide from this night forward that you're going to turn your home into a library. You have to do this, brother. No one can learn for you. No one. Commit that you're going to change after this night. You're going to become a pursuer of knowledge as a man. And that goes to you pastors too, because many pastors don't even read a book, including the Bible. They only read the Bible for sermons. <laughs> In a world of globalization, economic uncertainty, terrorism, culture clash, family disintegration, corporate distrust, youth disillusionment, political confusion, and religious corruption, the wisdom to navigate successfully through life is necessary. Welcome to Living Effectively. Living Effectively, a program designed to provide wisdom, insight, information, and inspiration to effectively face the challenges of the 21st century world. Living Effectively. Hi everybody, this is Dr. Miles Monroe and guess what? This is a special day around the world. Matter of fact, this week, everybody's focusing on men. That's right. And this is the day that we celebrate Father's Day all over the world. Now, of course, Mother's Day is a big day for many people around the world, but there couldn't be mothers without fathers. And I thank God for all the men in the world who are being upstanding good examples to their families. I want to encourage every father today to continue to be the foundation of your home and continue to lead your family in the way they should go. May God strengthen you as a man. And you know, one of the things I want to remind you of is that as a man, you are not the roof of the home, but you are the foundation. And the foundation carries the weight of the building. You are therefore not the head of the home. You are the head cornerstone, the Bible says, which is at the bottom. You hold the family together. Did you know that the word husband is from the word house bond? One that bonds the house together. A good man keeps the home together. So if a man doesn't keep his home together, he's not a good houseborn or a husband. So the next time you think of being a husband, think of being the one who keeps the family together. That's what a male is all about. And today we're going to learn about that on our program today. But just before we get into the teaching, here's some important announcements. Be back in a minute. Fatherhood means more than just the biological production of children. It means more than being married or single with or without children. Man is designed by God to reflect his nature in the lives of those around him. But knowing how to live out God's original blueprint for man is not automatic. In clear and compelling terms, Dr. Miles Monroe insightfully provides practical guidelines to help men master the skills of fatherhood and develop the qualities of leadership by showing them how to be the solid foundation of your family, develop the potential and gifts of children, learn what a father really is and does, Discover your life's vision and identify the five vital purposes of the male. This is a book for women as well as men because when a man fulfills his God-given purpose, the entire family is enriched. Available now at a bookstore near you or order online at www.bfmmm.com. Hi, we're back again. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we got great exciting things to do on the program today. I'm going to be speaking on fatherhood and how you can strengthen and, and really build up the men in your family. If you are a woman, you don't want to miss the teaching. If you are a man, go get yourself some of the rights of notes on. It's going to be a powerful session. And before we get into that, of course, we got some special music, of course, today by our men. That's right, men of standard. They're going to sing for you. Listen to these words as our men sing and prepare your hearts for the word of God. Holy fire burn away my desire anything that is not of you and deserve me I want more of you and less of me come on everybody say holy fire holy fire burn away my desire 
desire for anything that is not of you and is of me. I want I more. want more of you and less of me. One more time, holy fire. My desire for anything, anything that is not of you is of me. Is of me. I, want, I more. want more of you less of and less of me. Empty yeah. me, yeah. empty me, empty me. And friends, of course, that was Men of Standard. That's right. And don't forget, coming up this year, we got exciting things on tap. We, of course, got coming up in our ministry. You don't want to miss this. We have what we call our Kingdom Seminar coming up in August. August of 1 through 4th. That's going to be a powerful time. August 1st through 4th is the 2012 Miles Monroe Kingdom Training Seminar. Don't forget, get your registration in right now. It's going to be three and a half days of intensive teaching. I'm going to be spending over 11 hours a day teaching on the kingdom. That means 30 hours of intensive teaching on the kingdom. You don't want to miss it. Matter of fact, you would have seen an ad in our program today talking about it. Make sure go online and register right now and get your space in that seminar. It's limited seating, so you don't want to miss it. And of course, coming up later on, we've got our Real Men Conference coming up in October, our Singles coming up, conference coming up in September, and of course, November, ha, ah, the big one, our 2012 Global Leadership Summit is going to be a powerful time. Over 70 nations attended the meeting last year. We expect to even exceed that. So make sure that you register early. We got discounts for people who register early. Be a part of the Global Leadership Summit. That's November 5th through the 8th in Nassau, Bahamas at the Sheraton, sorry, at the Wyndham Resort. We're going to be at the Wyndham Resort this year. It's a powerful time with leaders from all over the world coming together. You don't want to miss it. Well, speaking of Father's Day, I want to wish all of our brothers around our nation and those watching beyond our nation, happy Father's Day. This message is just for you, to strengthen you, and for the women who love you, may they receive a blessing as well. Let's now go into the teaching as we study and look at the subject of fatherhood, understanding kingdom fatherhood. The purpose and power of the male man. 
I want to focus tonight on understanding the source of true manhood. It's tough being a man in the 21st century. And all of you are struggling with that manhood question. Men are very slow to admit that they need help. That's our male problem. So I want to focus on the perspective of what is God's definition of manhood. And I want to begin with a, a couple of comments relevant to what we're struggling with as men. First of all, this is what my conclusion is after traveling to over 89 countries. The greatest spiritual, social, economic, and psychological curse on humanity today is fatherlessness in every country. Fatherlessness. And what does that mean? 99% of the men in this room perhaps have never been told by their father face to face as a man that I love you. Maybe 96% of the men in this room never heard their father say to them, you make me proud. You done well. Not because your father is in the house does it mean he's fathering you. Another concern that I've concluded is this one statement. Dad is destiny. Write it down. I got this statement from a cover story from Newsweek magazine. They were doing a main article in Newsweek magazine during the period of Father, Father's Day and they did a research on fathers. And this statement was made by that secular magazine. Based on all of their research, they concluded that dad is destiny. And what they meant was, so go the men, so go the nation. I don't have time to give you all the stats that they talk about, but it's in that book on the table called The Principle of Fatherhood. Please read that book. Very important stats that they came up with. But they found out that 92% of all problems in society is related to the absence of a male in the family. Whether it's boys with guns or girls with babies. Dropouts of school, prisons filled with young men, all related, they say, to the absence of a father in the house. The secular world, therefore, agrees with God, finally. If you read what God's conclusion of humanity's problem is, it may shock you. But in the last chapter of Malachi, the last three verses, God concludes what man needs. He talks about the coming of the Messiah. He talks about John the Baptist being a forerunner to the coming of Christ. And then he says what would be the focus of the mission of Jesus. And what John would preach and emphasize. And here's what he says in Malachi. He will come and he will return the hearts of the children back, not to the mothers, but to the fathers, and the fathers back to the children. Otherwise, he says, I will curse the land. Wow. Which means whenever a society is crumbling and seem like it's under a curse, God says it's because the fathers are absent. Not the devil. Not the devil. 
After you read that statement in Malachi, you'll find a blank page in your Bible. If you check, there's a blank page. That blank page is 400 years of silence. God said nothing for 400 years. And then suddenly a man appears in the wilderness when you turn the page to Matthew 2 and it's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist introduces this great Messiah who came to return the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers. Here's what's interesting and mysterious to me. Jesus, when he came to solve man's problem, never chose a woman as a disciple. Why? He came to fix humanity. And he had to follow a blueprint. And the blueprint didn't call for women. He had to deal with the original blueprint to fix humanity, so he knew he had to deal with what the blueprint called for, and it called for the males to be fixed first. And the Bible says he chose 12, but the women followed. It's a very important scenario here. Men, you got to go get men. But women, they just show up, they're ready to shout. Women just show up. Let's have church, they say. But men, they play in sports, they out in the clubs, they drink in liquor, they smoke in dope, they in jail. You got to go get them. That's why churches are filled with women. He was dealing with healing humanity. Now let me tell you, What's happening to the male? Here's a verse you never saw before, guaranteed. It's found in Psalm 62. It talks about exactly what's happening to the male right now in your country. Psalm 62 talks about how we are treated as males. Here's what it says in verse 3. How long will you assault a man? Hmm. Would all of you throw him down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? That's what they're doing to us. We are already leaning. And they're pushing us. You could never do anything right, they say. You're just like your pa, they say. You could never succeed in anything. You are a loser. You can't even keep your children. You can't take care of your wife. You can't keep a job. They keep pushing. Look at that. How long will you assault a man? Society is assaulting us. David says they fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. Talking about man now. They take delight in lies. They lie on us. Men. They lie with their mouths and they bless. But in their hearts they curse us. He's talking about what they do to men. Listen to this. He says, but fine, rest, O oh my soul. Everybody say, rest has arrived. Rest has arrived. David says, even though they try to destroy me as a male, uh, I find my rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. Yes. My hope comes from him. Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. He alone is my rock and my salvation, yes, and he is my fortress. Yes. I will not be shaken. Men, we are in such dire straits, only God could help us. Stay with me. So here's what I call the male's mind today. Most of you could relate to this list. Men don't feel the power of self-confidence anymore. They don't feel the power of social roles anymore. Men don't feel the power of their masculinity anymore. That's why many of them are not sure whether they are men. Many men don't feel like they're wanted by women anymore. How many women have you met 
Who said to you, I don't need your car, I don't need your money, I don't need your house, I don't need nothing from you, I got everything myself. And some of you married women that are making you feel like dirt because when you met her, she had babies and house already. And then she puts pressure on you by saying, why don't you be a man? Well, you don't know what to be a man. You don't know what that means anymore. Because when your father was a man, it was easy. Remember? Being a man in your father's era was very easy. To be a man meant he had to go to work, bring home the bacon, build a house, provide the groceries, and pay for the kids. That was, a, that was to, to be a man, it was easy. A woman's job was to keep the house, cook the food, and nurse the babies. Everybody was clear. Today, that's finished. To be a man, you don't know what it's to be a man anymore. I mean, to be a man, so do I buy a house? She got a house. Do I buy a car? She got two. Do I give her children? She came with three of them already. Do I buy a grocery? She owns the refrigerator. Should I give her money? She bought on the pig, not just the bacon. She's making more than me. So now the guy is stuck. So what am I supposed to do to be a man now in this house? And that's your problem right now. Listen to me carefully. God sent me 2,000 miles to tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you don't feel wanted anymore. How many times have women threatened you? If you don't do what I say, you can get out. This is my house. You remember the days when your father was a man? He used to say, this is my house, and I, I wear the pants in this house. She wear pants too now. So what do you mean you wear the pants? It's tough to be a man. Men don't feel needed anymore. Of course she doesn't need you. Her salary is higher than yours. She owns the condominium. The car you're driving is her car. The TV you're watching is her TV. And the food in the refrigerator is her food and the fridge. And she tell you to be a man. That's why a lot of men don't know what to do. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel respected. And they don't feel secure. That's why many men act like women. They are feminized because they are threatened by the woman. I wish I had two more days to talk to you. Because you see, the problem is the woman don't know what she's doing to you. She needs help too. Because she's destroying your masculinity. Here's the other problem. I call it the male crisis. Write this down. The men have lost their sense of purpose. That's why they bounce from job to job to job. They don't know what their career is. They don't know what their vocation is anymore. They kind of move around, just kind of bounce around. They have no sense of purpose. Number two, they lost their identity. That's why they pretend to be other people. Sometimes men pretend to be women. They have no identity. Thirdly, men lost their definition of manhood. They don't know what it is. They also lost their value to life. They lost their meaning in their lives. They have no reason to live. Most men lost their role. They don't know what it is to be a man in society or in the home. They lost their sense of significance. They feel that they are not important to the world anymore. And the average man, that's why he drinks and is in gangs and he kills and he shoots and he domestically violates his family because he is a man who has no sense of value. He has no vision. He lost his sense of importance. He also lost his sense of authority. How many men are afraid to lift their voice in their own house? The children that live in your house ain't yours. So what do you do with them when they curse you back? They tell you, you're not my daddy. I mean, this is, this is frightening to some men. That's why a lot of you men, I know you're quiet in here. We're going to deal with this stuff. You go home to her children. You've been married for five years and the kids call you by your first name. No authority. And you can't correct them when they curse and do foolishness. You can't even correct them. There's no authority in the house. So you feel like a slave, like a dog. That's what men are dealing with today. And they are in this room. Men lost their sense of respect. 
No one respects the male anymore. So he doesn't respect himself either. And then men also lost what I call their own manhood. They lost their manhood. This is why they try to define manhood in very difficult ways. Now let me tell you the result of all of this crisis. The result is this, very important list. First of all, the challenge is that, is that the male is struggling with his purpose. He doesn't know why a male was created. He also is struggling with his manhood. He doesn't know what it is to be a man. And he also doesn't know what it is to have authority. He's trying to regain authority by force or by abuse. Men are also struggling with their self-image. They're not sure how to be a man, so they, they imitate other men who are not worthy of imitation. They're trying to find their image. And then men are also trying to live with a woman in the 21st century. It's almost impossible to live with a woman in the 21st century because she doesn't need nothing from you. You buy a wife, I mean a woman, a gift, she said, that's cheap. I mean, break your heart. You can't buy a car. She got two of them. You can't buy a clothing. She got a closet full when you met her. So men are struggling with how to live with a woman who has everything. It's challenging. And when you meet a woman who has her own house, her own car, refrigerator, food, clothes, and everything else, and you move into the house after you get married, it ain't your house. So there's that fear that stays with you all during them years. You're afraid to conflict with her. You're afraid to challenge her because she might put you out. Am I talking to anybody here? I know you all are quiet because I'm up in your face, but I want to deal with this, you see. Because if we're going to fix the men, we've got to first understand their problem. Now, what's the result of all of this confusion for the male? First of all, the male lost his self-image. We've got to deal with that this week. Secondly, he lost his self-concept, the picture of what a man's supposed to be like. He also lost his self-confidence. That's why most men are very timid, very shy and very angry, all mixed up in one. They also lost their self-worth. They don't feel valuable anymore. You know what made my father feel valuable? When my mother told him, thank you for bringing home food. Thank you for having a roof over our heads. Thank you for providing for the kids. That made him feel valuable. But you don't hear that no more today because the kids under the roof are hers. So you're struggling just to feel important to your wife. We also lost our sense of self-esteem. What makes us feel significant? We begin to hate ourselves. We lost our self-love. And therefore, we lost our conviction. Most men I meet have no conviction in life. They just want to kind of pay a bill and die. There's no sense of assignment, no sense of, of purpose, no sense of, of, of living for a reason. No conviction. That's why they sleep around. No conviction. Her baby's all over the city. No conviction. Now, ladies, uh, brothers, listen to me, brothers, listen to me. This resulted in a condition that we're dealing with. I call it the male condition. Write it down, confusion. The average man is confused. Why? He's confused with everything. He don't know who he is, why he is, where he is, what he is, and why he's going, where he's going. He don't, he don't understand the women, don't understand what women want, don't understand what society wants from him. So he's confused. And therefore, he's also angry. 90% of the men in this room are angry men. You won't admit that, but I know that's true. And your anger is deeply concealed. I guarantee you that all the men, all the men in prison are angry men. All. And if you, listen, I've done interviews with these men for my books. Everyone was angry. And 90% of them was angry at their father who they never met or who they never saw, or who was never there, or who they couldn't talk to. They were angry, and their anger comes out in frustration. 
And the frustration comes out in self-hatred. And the self-hatred is manifested in depression. And most men are depressed and they quietly carry their anger. And they are afraid. And because men are afraid, they go to the gym. And they buy protein products. And they pump iron and they, and they try to look big because they are afraid. It's called concealed fear. And that fear makes them violent. In other words, if I can't be a man because I can't buy you clothing and shoes, I'll slap you to show you I'm a man. Bam! And he slaps the woman. Picks her. Why? I'm a man, he says. He's angry. Why would a man take a can of paint and go to a newly painted wall and deface it? He's angry at society. And that anger is in this room. We got to get rid of that anger. Domestic violence comes from resentment. The reason why men are resentful is because they are so angry, they want to blame everybody else for their anger. So they transfer it. Resentment means you transfer what you are feeling to other people. You blame them for your own behavior. My father was in there. My mother mistreated me. I was abused when I was small. I mean, this resentment, we transfer it. That results in social abandonment. That's when men give up on society. There's no hope. No use me going to school. No use me trying to get a good job. No use to me trying to advance myself. They just abandon themselves to society and say, I'm not getting involved in the rat race, they say. They give up. And so we get gangs all over the city. We got all kind of social clubs. We got all kind of, of, uh, of uh, fraternities. All these different things we try to, because we've given up. And the last thing is that men manifest this hatred in domestic abdication. Abdication means he decides to leave the home. I can't take it anymore, I'm out of here. That's why divorce rates are so high. Infidelity is so high. Abandoning kids is so high. Spreading your sperm around the city is so high. Why? You just abandon society. Domestic abandonment. I ain't, lady, I'm out of here. I'm out of here, woman. I'm gone. Because the man is suffering that whole list. Let me tell you something. Even getting saved doesn't solve this problem. I know of preachers who beat their wives full of the Holy Ghost. I know preachers who curse at their children, mad, curse at their wives, slap them, and then preach the next morning. Because they never dealt with the, the real issue. Manhood. Why is this important to talk about? Because if we don't deal with this, this is the response we're going to get. I am glad you're here tonight and will be here the next two days because in order for the male to get help, he has to respond correctly. Here's what I am recommending and I'm happy to see you because I think you're responding correctly. One, for the male to have solutions to his problems, he must first recognize he needs help. And that's tough for a male to admit. Secondly, he must accept the need for help. And thirdly, he must admit that he doesn't know some things. You know, man, you know how we are. Don't look at me like that. We think we know everything. You know what can tell me nothing. I ain't going to no seminar. I'm a man. I ain't going to no conference. I know who the man is. You don't know who the man is. You can't even sleep with your own wife. You got to admit you don't know some things. All right. Yes, sir. I read four books a month. That's a tough thing to do. My iPad got all my books in. And I, the reason why I read so much is because I don't want to be stupid. I got a family, a wife and kids that I have to lead. I have 
companies that have to lead. I have one of the largest churches in my country to lead. I got a government. I got 17 countries that look to me for advice. Yes. Presidents and prime ministers look to me for advice. I got to keep reading. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. When was the last time you read a book and finished it? Wow. Wow. Mm. It's good, it's good. You know why you don't read? You think you know everything already. That's your problem. You got to admit that you don't know. And number four, you must seek the help of successful men. We go to the wrong men to get help. Here's a guy who's been divorced five times and you go to him for advice. That's stupid, man. I'm talking with your brother. I mean your blood brother. He can't even stay married. Don't listen to him. You're talking to men who never had a business and wanted business advice from them. Seek successful men and then submit to them. And number five, commit yourself to pursue knowledge. Men, I challenge you to decide from this night forward that you're going to turn your home into a library. Yes, yes, sir. You have to do this, brother. No one can learn for you. No one. Commit that you're going to change after this night. You're going to become a pursuer of knowledge as a man. And that goes to you pastors too, because many pastors don't even read a book, including the Bible. They only read the Bible for sermons. <laughs> You got to pursue knowledge. And number six, write this down. Invest in your own education. Listen, man, it costs money to buy books and CDs. You, your pastor got a bunch of CDs in that, in that store back there, and you never go there and get a CD from five years ago. Why? You think you know everything. Wow. Man. Invest. Yes. Yes. One time I was with one of my mentees out in California. You know, my mentees traveled me some time, and, and he, this one was with me. We went to a... Every time I go to a country or to a city, I go to find a bookstore. Yes, sir. I love books. And I went to the bookstore, and I picked up some books, you know, on leadership and management, all this stuff. It came to $287. And the mentee said to me, oh, my God. I said, what happened? He says, Shoo. <laughs> you spend that much money on books? I said, yep, this, this, is, this, is, this is low. I normally spend three, 400 bucks on books. He said, wow, I've never seen that before. I said, that's why I'm the mentor. You're the mentee. Watch me. <laughs> So, so we got back in the car, we were driving to the restaurant to eat, and he said, he was quiet for a while, and he said, he said, Dr. Munro, I just can't believe what you just did. I said, what? He said, you just paid $287 for books. That's someone's salary. I said, yep. He said, uh, man, boy, that's a, that's a lot of money to spend on, on, on books. I said, listen to me. The value and the cost of ignorance is always higher than knowledge. Yes, yes. The Bible says all you're getting, get understanding. And then it says if it costs you all you have, get understanding. Proverbs 4 verse 7. You got a choice between a book and a box of chicken after this meeting. I'm serious. And some of you are going to go right past the book table and go get your KFC and you're going to become more ignorant with a bunch of cholesterol. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> When you eat chicken, it stays in your system for six hours. Yeah. It comes out of the drought, Jesus That's says. Right. Yes, sir. But you buy a book and read it, it stays forever. Yeah. You got a choice between that 20 bucks for a book or chicken. Yes, sir. You have to invest in your own development. And number seven, accept your weakness. Men, if you're going to become real men, first you got to be honest with yourself where you are weak. Yes, sir. I don't know everything. I got a problem in this area. I got a habit that's killing me. I have a weakness for women. I got a weakness for drugs. I got a weakness for, for liquor. In other words, be honest first. Stop pretending, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you're okay. And then secret pornography is eating you up. Accept your weakness. Because I can't help you unless you first tell me you need it. Come on, man. Come on. 
Jesus never volunteered a miracle. Never. That's right. You didn't know that, huh? Every miracle he performed was a result of a question. What can I do for you, he says. He met a blind man one time. He said, what can I do for you? I mean, come on. It's supposed to be obvious. No, it ain't obvious because the blind man made his money by his blindness. You got to accept that you need help. And number eight, when you identify your weaknesses, magnify your strengths. Every male in here got some strong things in his life that are very good. And that's what we got to bring out of you this week. You are a good man, believe me. You've done some bad things, but you are a good man. And we got to go after the good man inside of you. Do you know why every man in here love comic books? Let me tell you why you love comic books. You love Superman, all of you love Superman, Batman, you know, Green Hornet, all these guys, you love them. You know why you love them? How, all these guys, you love them. You know why you love them? Because they remind you of you. All of us are two men in this room. <laughs> That's why you love those characters. They are, they are you. Everybody got a Superman and a Clark Kent. And you never want us to see Clark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. We love Batman, but Bruce Banner is a problem. <laughs> you know what's amazing is when your wife discovers Bruce. My God. <laughs> look at you, look at you guys going, oh, please, Dr. Monroe, please. <laughs> I discovered something. If you tell your wife about Clark, yeah. she will have a greater respect for Superman. That's up. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's good. Wow. Wow. That is good. That's up. I remember the day when I decided to tell my wife about Bruce Banner. <laughs> I had to think the whole day before I talked to her that night, the whole day. And we were early in our marriage, you know, and I told her, look, let me tell you a part of me that you need to know. And I need you to help me strengthen and get rid of that person. Amen. And when I shared it with my wife, she hugged me. She said, Nothing a woman wants more from a man than honesty. That's what she said to me. She said, you just made me love you more. Amen. From that day, my wife has been the solution to my weakness. She protects that area of my life all those years until it's down to zero. She's made me Superman every day. I want to read a verse to you that you probably never saw before also. I call it the call to men. David was a great father. His son was Solomon. David was a great king, a great politician. He's also a musician, a songwriter, very multi-talented guy. David is on his deathbed about to die. I want you to read what David says to his son. It says in the book of 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to his son, Solomon. Now watch a father talk to a, a son. Quote, I am about to go the way of all the earth. He said, so be strong and show yourself a man. Now that's a good statement from a daddy. Come on, give David a hand. That's, that, that's good stuff, right? That's Boy, they're powerful, isn't it? Yes, yes, what a good word for a father to yes. say to a son. Yes, son, I'm about to die. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. Yes, That's in the Bible. Yes, 
Yeah. Yeah. And now he's going to tell him how to show himself a man. He says, first of all, observe what the Lord your God requires. Yeah. Secondly, walk in his ways. Thirdly, keep his decrees and his commands. Fourthly, he says, keep his laws and requirements that are written in the book. And then he says, so that you may prosper in all you do. And whatever, wherever you go, son, you're going to be okay if you keep the law I taught you. Boy, that's a good daddy talking. Did your father leave you the word of God like that? Or he just kind of left you? He just left you, didn't he? He left you when you were nine. He left you when you was 14. He left before you was born. And no man ever came to you and says, now show yourself a man. Because most men don't know what a man is. That's why I'm here. I'm here to show you how to be a man. Because most men don't know what a man is. David says, show yourself a man. And he knew what a man looked like. A man who keeps the law of God, keeps his requirements, who obeys his statutes, who walk in his ways. He said, David, if you do that, you'll make plenty of money. You will live long. You'll keep your body pure. You won't drink liquor and smoke dope. Mm. You won't keep bad company. You'll prosper. The last part, he says, and the Lord will keep his promises to me. This is a deep one, Pastor. He said, listen, son, if you be a man, the promises God gave me will be fulfilled in you. Yes, sir. Do you have a son? Are you talking to your son? My son is 27 years old, I told you. He dropped me to the airport last week and he hugged me in the airport. He's bigger than me, big guy. Hugged me. He said, Dad, have a good trip. A lady came to me from the, behind the counter in the airport. She says, is that your son? I said, yes. He just hugged you. I said, yes. And she started crying. She said, he's a man. I said, yeah. He just told he loved you. I said, yeah. I always tell my son I love him. Tell him I love him. 27 years old. He's a man. She cried. She said, my husband left my son when he was seven years old. And no man ever hugged him. And told him he loved him. And now my son is 18 and he's in prison. She said, I wish I had seen that. Do you tell your son you love him at age 18? Yes. Did your father tell you is the question. Defects. The vision God gave you is supposed to be transferred to your son. So let me, I got a lot more to say, but our time is gone. Let me just, let me just drive this home very quickly. Why is the male so important? Let me give you the first answer. Number one, because the male is God's strategy. Come on now. For ruling the earth. That's how important you are, man. You are God's secret weapon. And the devil knows it. That's why the pressure's on you. The devil is so afraid of men, he sends women to church. The devil is not afraid of women, I'm telling you. He don't care how many of them come to church and worship God. Just keep the men out of God's presence. Because the devil knows the strategy. Why is man so important? Because the male is God's foundation for his human family. When I discovered how important I was, my whole thinking changed. Let me show you how important you are. 
First of all, God's plan was to expand his kingdom from heaven on earth. We know that. He also wanted to fill the earth with his glory, to colonize earth with his very kingdom of heaven. And God also wanted to fill the earth with his culture. How do you use culture to transform an environment? You put your people there. That's why you got Chinatown and Japanese town and Haitian town and Jamaican town, all the towns in America. Because when the people gather, the culture yeah, is developed. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Come on, Are you following me? Yes, sir. That is called colonization. Wow. Yes, sir. That's what God wants to do with earth. Matter of fact, Matthew 6, 9, Christ, when you pray, don't pray to go to heaven. He says, pray like this. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done where? On earth. How? Just like it is in heaven. He said, I want heaven to come to earth, not earth to go to heaven. Come on now, teach that. Yes, sir. We keep praying the wrong prayer. We pray for rapture. We pray for escape. We pray for deliverance. God says, no, I want to pray for invasion and occupation. That's right. I got excited tonight. You know, I hear things from people when they talk. I, I listen to you to see what kind of man you are. You know what I heard you to say tonight? You said you're going to build a faith city. I got excited. Why? That's a kingdom mentality. We ain't going nowhere. We're taking over the city. Clap, 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 clap. We're going to bring heaven to earth. I had a board meeting last night with my, my board. And we were discussing our next moves for 2012. You know, we just bought 57 acres of land in the Bahamas. That's a lot of acres on an island only seven miles wide. We bought 57 acres on the beach. And our plan is to build a hotel resort and a first class resort there for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Why? We got to possess. Yeah. The land is paid for. Own it. Yes, sir. Dominion. In other words, he wants to fill the earth with the culture of heaven. Now, for God to do that, he had to set up a strategy. And what is God's strategy? Is to bring the kingdom on earth. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is a country governed by a king with, with the citizens acting just like the king. I was born in 1954 in a kingdom. I wasn't born in a country. I was born in what they call a colony in 1954. I lived in a colony until 1973. So I was under a kingdom until 1973. I used to wake up, wake up every morning and sing to a king and queen I never saw. So when I read the Bible, I don't read the Bible like you. I read the Bible the way it's supposed to be read. I understand kingdom. A kingdom is a country, not a religion. And God wanted to bring the country of heaven to earth. So earth can be filled with the culture of heaven. That's why he put you here. As a matter of fact, God in Genesis 1, 26 says this, let us make man in our own image and let them have what? Dominion over what? The earth, fish, birds, cattle, and creeps. God created you to have dominion over earth. Not to live in heaven. That's where you came from. You are aliens. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh boy, you can't handle that. All these years you've been looking for aliens, and you are one yourself. <laughs> Give God a hand for the alien spirit you have here. You were sent here from heaven to dominate earth. In other words, God sent you here to impact this particular planet with his image. Yes, sir. The word image, write it down. It means nature. It means full essence of a thing. It means characteristics. God made you with his characteristics, his nature. Therefore, he gave you what we call his personality. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word for image is personality. Mm. Let us make man in our personality. Come on, now. Wow. Personality is what makes the difference when you walk into a room. You affect the environment. That's why it's called glory. As a matter of fact, the book of Genesis is very important. God says, look, I want to fill the earth with my culture, mm. my glory. The word glory is the word kabod. It means actually imprint. Wow. Pressure, weight. Yes, to imprint on something. Ha. So God's plan in Genesis 1 is a summary of what God wanted to do. In chapter 2, God showed us how he did it. Look at Genesis 2 verse 4. Why don't you read this verse? When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, it says, there was no shrub nor grass of the field that he had appeared. Can you tell me why? Because there was no rain. 
Right? Why? Because the Lord had not sent rain. Why? Because there was no man to work. Now, this is very deep. Don't forget what I'm saying. We got the planet Earth. The Earth is filled with potential. But it says God didn't allow anything to grow because there was no man. Look at it. He didn't send rain because there was no man. Look at the verse. The reason God created you is because he needed someone to work the earth. The word work there, write it down work, is the Hebrew word manage. Management. He had no manager. You were sent to earth by God to manage the planet on behalf of God. And God didn't allow anything to grow until there was a man to manage it. Please read my book over there on, on burden of freedom. Very important. But the whole book is about this one principle. And friends, our time is gone. The message is not finished yet, but you can get the entire teaching by ordering right now our CD and DVD copies of this teaching. It includes, of course, the visual notes. And so you can really take this DVD and show it to your family, buy copies for your friend and men in your family, bless them with it, and they can become stronger men. I was, I'm so grateful again for all of you who've been supporting our programs. I want to thank those of you who have called in and written us and said we've been blessing to you. Thank you for letting us know. And by the way, for all the men who are watching today, if you were to call in right now and let us know that you have been blessed by this wonderful teaching, you can actually just call and let us know that and then come by our Diplomat Center in Nassau, if you're watching it in Nassau, come by and we're going to have this teaching for you at a special discount just for men. Now normally these CDs cost around $7. We're going to make it available for every man for $4 because you have to get this message. We're going to actually sell it to you at cost because we want you to get it. Come down to the Diplomat Center, Faith, Life and Book and Music Center and get a copy of the teaching on fatherhood. And all the women who come, we're going to definitely give you the same price. Get copies for the men in your family, your brother, your cousin, your uncle, your father, your, 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 uh, your nephew. Bless a male in the family that they may grow to be strong men. And again, to all of the men in our country, those of you who are good men, thank you for being a mortal. Those of you who are struggling, maybe you're having addictions with, with all kinds of problems with drugs and alcohol, God is your strength. We pray for the Lord to deliver you today from that habit. Some of you have been uh, accused of abusing your family, maybe your wife, physical abuse, or abusing your children. May God forgive you today and restore you to sanity and bring you back to Him. Those of you who have been divorced, maybe you lost your family, remember that God is a restorer of the broken heart. He will bring you back together as a man and give you a second chance in life. You gotta come to Him first though, and then He will give you that second chance. I pray that you will submit to His Lordship today and receive Christ as your Savior and your Redeemer as a man. And then finally, I'd like to wish all of the men in our nation, including my father, uh, you know, Brother Matthias Monroe is now 87 years old and he's my daddy and he's still alive. I say, Happy Father's Day, Dad. We love you. From all the children in your family, we love you and thank you so much for being a powerful dad in our lives. You provide a good foundation for us and we thank you for your faithfulness to God. Again, Happy Father's Day to everyone and continue to bless the Lord at all times. See you next week right here on Living Effectively. Thank you for joining us today on Living Effectively. For copies of this program, the complete teaching series, books, CDs, DVDs, magazines, and other resource materials by Dr. Miles Monroe, or information on seminars, conferences, workshops, and itinerary travels to your area, Visit our website at milesmonroeinternational.com or bfmmm.com. Email us at info at mmi.com. And remember, our mission is to help you live effectively.